So I'm delighted to be with you today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to visit with you. Harold, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. More importantly, let me thank Harold for his decades of outstanding service to the 300,000 men, 300, men and women of the International Association of Firefighters and to working families uh, everywhere. Howard, uh, um, Harold is one of those union presidents that union presidents listen to because of his outstanding leadership of this organization. Uh, for all the challenges that are facing the labor movement, the International Association of Firefighters has continued to grow every quarter for the last two decades. That says a lot about Harold's leadership, Tom's leadership, your leadership in local communities. Congratulations to you for continuing to grow. Now, like you, I know a little something about what it means to fight for working families. Almost uh, 30 years ago, when I was a young man with hair and uh, fewer pounds, uh, I worked in Houston as a field representative for your brothers and sisters at the Seafarers International Union. That's where I first met uh, Harold. I worked directly with our members, helping them to navigate bureaucracies. I represented them in Social Security disability hearings, among other things. And those members gave me an education that is much more valuable than you could get out of a hundred of the best written textbooks. That experience inspired me to devote my career to the cause we all believe in and the values we all share. The simple idea that American families should be able to get good jobs, get paid a living wage, have a voice in their workplace, and arrive home safe and healthy after their jobs are done. Those are the values that, that animate my work and the work of my 17,000 colleagues at the U.S. Department of Labor every day. We are your allies in the effort to build a strong middle class and to keep open multiple pathways into the middle class. Just one example was the wage and hour division's decision early in the Obama administration to ensure that we read the Fair Labor Standards Act correctly so that all firefighting personnel, including frontline supervisors, lieutenants, and captains, enjoyed overtime and fair wage protections. We We should all be able to agree that the men and women who put their lives on the line every day to protect their neighbors and their communities must receive a fair day's pay for an honest day's work. <clears throat> now, President Obama shares our commitment to the cause of growing our economy from the middle class out rather than from the top down. In his State of the Union address last month, the President laid out his vision for the American economy, an economic recovery powered by a growing middle class with rising wages and more job opportunities. And he knows a thriving middle class depends upon a robust labor movement and public servants who provide essential services that make middle class life in America possible. Here's the good news. Thanks to President Obama's leadership and the resilience of the American people, the economy continues to climb out of the depths of the Great Recession. Ten days ago, my department reported that unemployment fell to 7.7 percent. That's the lowest it's been since December 2008. Retail sales increased 1.1 percent in February. Applications for initial unemployment benefits are low and they continue to fall. Professional and business services added 73,000 jobs last month. The housing sector is bouncing back, providing a shot in the arm to construction employment, which experienced its largest one-month growth since March 2007. In all, the economy added 246,000 private sector jobs in February. That makes for three uninterrupted years of private sector job growth and a total of almost 6.4 million private sector jobs that we've added to the American economy. That's the good news. The bad news is that shrinking public sector employment continues to be a drag on the economy. 10,000 jobs lost in February and more than 742,000 jobs 
lost since June of 2009. Now, previous recoveries have been marked by a rebound, a growth in government jobs, even when anti-government conservatives have controlled the White House and both houses of Congress. But we're not seeing that this time. Public sector employment has not been this low for 30 years. The great majority of the public sector job losses, and you know this, have been at the local level. That means fewer cops, fewer teachers, fewer EMTs, and yes, fewer firefighters. And here's the thing. When there are fewer firefighters, that doesn't mean there are fewer fires. When there are fewer EMTs, that doesn't mean there are fewer 911 calls. Just as fewer teachers doesn't mean fewer children who desperately need a high quality public education and fewer cops doesn't mean fewer streets to patrol. The demand for public services doesn't diminish when the number of public employees goes down. So what does that mean for you and your members? It means you are working harder than ever with fewer resources, less leverage, less control over your economic destiny. Together we're fighting to stem this tide. The President and your great friend, Vice President Joe Biden, fought for the American Jobs Act that would have restored funding for local cops, firefighters, EMTs, and teachers because they know that more investment in more localities for more public services makes for a strong America and a strong middle class and because they know that public employees are the heartbeat of communities nationwide. The problem is that many in Congress and in state houses around the country, to put it mildly, don't exactly agree. We're facing ideological contempt for public employees and public employee unions that is unprecedented in its dishonesty and its ferocity. Lawmakers and elected officials from coast to coast have decided to scapegoat public employees for their own failures to properly manage state and local fiscal challenges. How many of you have heard this one that was making the rounds a few years ago? A unionized public employee, a small government conservative, and a CEO are sitting around the table. In the middle of the table is a plate that's got 12 cookies on it. CEO reaches over, he grabs 11 of the cookies, and then he turns to the small government conservative and says, look out, that union guy wants a piece of your cookie. I'll wait, you have to think about that one a little bit, I know. I give that to you, feel free to tell that yourselves. It is really unfathomable how many pundits and professional political hatchet men looked around and somehow decided it wasn't reckless Wall Street shenanigans that crashed our economy under President Bush. Instead, they tell us, it was dedicated public servants who are scraping to get by on middle class wages. Have any of you ever met a firefighter who got a multi-million dollar bonus? They're as common as unicorns being ridden by leprechauns with angels sitting on their shoulders. In the financial, if the financial sector was too big to fail, then I think America's firefighters' courage is too big for us to fail them. Let's be clear, this is not a question of you being asked to give a little more. This isn't about deferring a wage increase here or upping your contribution to a pension plan there. We all know that many of you have had to painfully give a few concessions at the bargaining table on occasion to share the sacrifice of difficult economic times. But that's not going to be enough for those who have targeted you. They want to tear apart the bargaining table and turn it into a pile of firewood. Their goal isn't to give you a little haircut, it's to cut your head off. Their goal through a campaign of denigration, distortion, and demonization is to destroy public employee unions as we know them and to eliminate them as a force in American life. 
Over the last few years, the IAFF has withstood a withering assault, standing up for collective bargaining rights that a majority of Americans support. That's right, a majority of Americans stand behind collective bargaining. When the governor of Wisconsin tried to divide and conquer, the firefighters were clear, an injury to one is an injury to all. When the in issue was put to the people of Ohio, the people of Ohio rendered a clear verdict. Workers deserve a seat at the table, not a kick in the butt. We stand with you on this. President Obama has made clear that unions are part of the solution to our economic challenges, not a part of the problem. If we're going to have growth and widely shared prosperity, then workers must have a voice. Collective bargaining is responsible for so many advances in workers' rights over generations. Higher wages, guaranteed pensions, reliable health benefits, safe workplaces, fair leave policies, and many, many more. But just as important, collective bargaining lets us solve workplace problems when they arise and right in the workplace. I would rather have a firefighter and his shop steward sit down with a manager to work things out than rely on politicians in a state house or a governor's mansion to fix what's wrong in a firehouse. Now, I, I, I wish I could say that the fiscal decisions being made in Washington are somehow saner than what we're seeing in state houses. But sadly, that's not the case. Our friend, a uh, great friend, Senator Claire McCaskill, talked about this a little bit, I know, before I came out. Uh, I also know that uh, the IAFF just celebrated its 95th anniversary of fighting for firefighters in the communities that they serve. At the Department of Labor, we're also having an anniversary. This is our 100th year um, of serving America's working families. And to mark the occasion, your birthday and ours, Congress sent us a present. It's called sequestration. Now there's a phrase you don't hear, right? There's a phrase you don't use in conversation ever, right? The only time maybe you've ever heard the word sequestration back in your communities is if a friend of yours had the misfortune to get picked for a jury on a criminal trial and they got stuck in a hotel room with bad food and no TV, right? That's the only sequester any of us have ever seen. But let's call sequestration what it really is. Another obstacle in the path of our economic recovery and the President's efforts to strengthen and expand the middle class. Instead of setting priorities and compelling lawmakers to make intelligent, responsible decisions, it imposes automatic, arbitrary, across-the-board cuts throughout the federal government. This was a task that called for a scalpel so Congress pulled out its meat cleaver. Now, I don't think about this so much in terms of line items and dollar figures in the Labor Department's budget. It is going to cost us $3.1 billion. I measure the impact in terms of the people we're not going to be able to help, the people who won't get the job training and job placement services they need, the long-term unemployed who won't get the same level of unemployment benefits that they need to weather tough times. And because there may be fewer resources available for grant programs that your national leadership has fought so hard to put in place, the SAFER program, the FIRE program, the impact is going to be felt in less training, fewer personnel, inadequate equipment, and reduced safety at firehouses across the country. This is no way to get our fiscal house in order. The President has offered a balanced deficit reduction plan that asks the wealthy to do their fair share and proposes a serious effort at entitlement reform, but without cutting the services that we need to help middle class families. But instead, one side in Congress is choosing to further undermine public safety and economic security because they don't want to close unproductive tax loopholes that contribute nothing to American economic growth because they don't want to ask millionaires and billionaires and the largest and wealthiest corporations in our country to pay just a little bit more. That's the wrong path for the middle class, 
It's the wrong path for the economy. It's the wrong path for the nation. And when you visit Capitol Hill on Wednesday, I know you all are storming the hill later on this week. I hope you'll tell your members of Congress to reverse the sequester and to reverse it right now. Now, like you, I'm a government employee. I work for a public entity that's committed to serving the people. At the U.S. Department of Labor, when people call us for help, whether it's about unemployment compensation or filing a workers' comp claim or a workplace safety issue, I can assure you it's a pretty urgent matter. But when you get the call for help in your town, your community, it's a matter of life and death. So to everyone in this room and the people back home you represent, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for your selflessness and your sacrifice. Thank you for the awe-inspiring responsibilities that you take on every day. Thank you for your fearlessness, for your willingness to stare danger in the face without blinking. Thank you for being there when terrorists slam planes into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. For being there when Katrina devastated dozens of Gulf Coast communities for being there when Sandy struck my hometown last October, for being there to save our forests, for being there, no questions asked, every single day to give us just a little security and a small bit of peace of mind. Thank you not just for being the guardians of public safety, but for being one of the strongest threads in the fabric of our communities. Thank you for being generous neighbors and good citizens, an indelible part of civic life in America. The least that we can do for you, the very least, after all you've done for us, is to build an economy that allows you a measure of security and a piece of the American dream, a decent salary and benefits, a home in which to raise your families, a nest egg for a dignified retirement. That's what I'm going to continue fighting for. That's President Obama's North Star. You've never let us down. We'll do everything in our power to return the favor, to repay our debt of gratitude to you. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you again for everything you do all day. <laughs>